Hey everyone, happy Friday. It's John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch. And on this one, we're touching on a subject that is kind of close to my heart. This is a case that really bothers me. Uh, someone recently asked me for my top five cases that I would love to see solved. This is certainly on the list. So we're gonna roll back a little bit. April 18th, 2016, on a rainy Monday morning in Midlothian, Texas, someone wearing police SWAT type gear entered a church and murdered a 45 year old fitness instructor, mother, wife, and former special needs teacher. Two years and seven Lord and Arts videos later, we still don't have a suspect identified in the murder of Missy Beavers. We actually haven't done an update on this case since January of 2017. So I wanted to look back on this case, uh, bring on a special guest, and kind of bring you guys up to date on things that have happened since the last video. Um, so it's gonna be a little different than the usual interview I do. This is gonna be a little bit, one part interview, one part news updates. So let me introduce my guest for today, Tim Coville. He's been working on doing a deep dive uh, on his new podcast, Gumshoe Stories, about this particular case. Over at gumshoestories.com, you can check out the research. I learned a lot uh, from the first episode and from the research that's presented there. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me, John. Good to be here. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to ask how you came to the decision to focus on this particular case. What, what moved you to make this the case for your podcast? I, I believe that going back to 2016 on that morning of April 18th, I, I may not have heard about the case that day, but I believe it was the next day on the Today Show that uh, I saw you know, this image of a police officer walking around or who, who looked like a police officer. And uh, the reporting was that this was the killer caught on video. And, uh, you know, a murder in a church um, was an especially egregious detail of the case. And I live in Texas and it occurred in Texas. So those things just captured my attention. And I haven't been able to put it aside since. Yeah, I think that's one aspect of this case, why there's why it's got such wide national appeal and attention is because of the footage. It's particularly terrifying for most of us to think that, first of all, someone would do this in a church, that someone would dress up as uh, people that we trust to help us when we're in trouble, and then to use that as their cover for getting away with something like this is, is really, really terrible. Um, can you tell me just a little bit about your co-hosts for gumshoestories.com? How'd you guys all find each other? Uh, we found each other on social media. Um, I have a couple of cohorts, I guess, on our Gumshoe Stories podcast, uh, Faith and the Duchess. And uh, we we kind of met in Facebook groups and um, a website called Web Sleuths, which is devoted to many murder cases, including the, the Missy Beavers case. And it just kind of began as a conversation. And what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And it was kind of developed from there, just a, a common interest in the case among the three of us. Yeah, we're definitely uh, friendly with uh, web sleuths in particular. You know, we've donated to Trisha when she's needed help and we use them as a source pretty frequently on the channel. I actually went looking today for informations about, uh, information about this particular case there. It seems like they've closed out almost all of their threads. They still have a few threads open just about links about the stories, but it seems like they're trying to shut down a lot of the conversation. I did also notice a trend um, with law enforcement talking to the media, particularly about social media, um, hampering their investigation. And it's interesting because I've literally been talking about this same topic over the past week uh, in terms of the Lindsey Buziak case, of course. And then even on Johnny Vlogs this week, I covered, you know, is social media really um, bogging down these investigations? I'm still struggling with that concept, um, you know, but in this particular case, they're saying that they had to deal with 13 to 1400 tips that came in when this thing hit, you know, national coverage. Um, it's a lot of work. So I, I certainly understand it's a lot to go through. I think the thing I struggle with is 13 to 1400 tips doesn't necessarily mean 13 to 1400 different theories 
or different aspects to look into, I think that number is much smaller. So it'd be more interesting to me to know, you know, how many leads were actually coming out of those tips. I mean, how many of those phone calls can you just say, uh, you know, okay, you think this person looks like that person. There's nothing we can do with that and disregard that phone call. Um, but they did seem to point to Facebook in particular. I've always been a little leery of using Facebook as a source because it just, it's such a rumor mill. You know, there's just, there's a lot of churn in there. Did you find anything in terms of material that helped you with the podcast on Facebook specifically? Um, Only in the sense that some of the people that I have used as resources to help gather information, um, things such as search warrants, public information documents. I, I networked with those people as a result of meeting them in Facebook groups that are devoted to the case. Now, not every Facebook group is the same. Uh, some of them are, I would say, not as professional acting in terms of the individuals and uh, you know, well-managed as far as moderation of the forum and not letting it just go crazy. Uh, yeah. you know, some groups, as you know, from, from looking at, at different cases, um, some groups it's like high school again, and people don't know how to, how to behave like adults and how to discuss a case, um, in an adult manner. Yeah. And that is a, an unfortunate side effect that has affected this case. Uh, I've read several articles about people who feel like their lives have been disrupted because they've been mentioned as, you know, being a potential suspect in this case. Uh, Obviously, the police have not really identified any person as a suspect. They do have some persons of interest. We're going to talk about a few of those today. Um, But when it comes to Facebook, there's no rules for that. And, you know, people see a picture of Missy with some lady and they're like, oh, maybe that lady's the one in the outfit. So uh, I do think that there is a distinction to make with Um, people that are being more responsible in terms of their analysis and talking about these things, uh, then, you know, between that and the rumor mill for sure. And it's, it's great to hear that you've recognized that as well. And I can tell from the research that you've pulled together and those warrants are really interesting to look at, particularly when they're talking about the justification for why they're searching for that information. I think that's been our best source as outsiders looking into this to try to figure out what's really going on with this case. And we're going to touch on several of those points as we go through this today, too. Um, so Brandon, he's spoken to the media a few times, uh, and he's acknowledged that he was pretty much kind of somewhat unemotional during the actual time of her murder and those initial interviews that he did, um, but says that he was focused on specifically on taking care of their daughters. What was your initial opinion of Brandon in those early days, those early interviews? My initial uh, point that I would make about Brandon uh, early on, the impression he made on me was this was a gentleman who probably needed a family spokesman to 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 get up there and represent the family. Um, I don't think that he necessarily comes across in the way that he intends. Yeah. And um, for, for anyone who is looking at the case closely, it, it seemed like whatever he said was going to be taken the wrong way by somebody. And um, I, I think that he struggled with portraying himself in the, in the right way. He He's a rather unemotional person, I think, just just generally, which is not to say that he doesn't have emotions, just he, he doesn't wear his emotions on his sleeves. Yeah. And so for some people who watch those early interviews, I mean, even literally the day of or the day after where he's telling the media um, as he's putting out his, his initial statement, he's saying that he doesn't want to pull on heartstrings. And this is like 24 hours within the the death of his wife in a tragic manner. And and that struck some people the wrong way. I don't think that he intended it that way, but for someone who always wants to look at the spouse as being involved in a suspicious murder, that, that gives them fodder. Yeah. And then of course we do get details in this case that really in terms of motive, there's a lot of information there for people to actually consider that Brandon, now he has an alibi. He has a a clean alibi. I mean, he's out of the state when this occurs. 
Um, and I, from information I reviewed, it seems like that has been solidly confirmed. I mean, like flight information verified, uh, ping information verified for where he is. Um, but I still struggle with it. And you raise a very good point because even on current stuff where I see him interviewed that isn't quite fully about the case, but just kind of related to it. He still makes these comments where I'm like smacking myself in the forehead going like, is this guy talking like this? <laughs> like, why? Why is he phrasing things in this way? Yeah, you make a really good point. I, I wish that he he did have someone to help him kind of communicate in those environments. Um, in December of 2017, uh, he stated he can no longer focus on trying to find her killer. And once again, he kind of defers to that he needs to continue focus on their daughters. Uh, he also stated that his daughters are not interested in focusing on finding the killer. Uh, Missy and Brandon's girls are now around the ages of 17, 15, and 10. And we might hear by the end of this video that one of the daughters in particular might not fit that statement exactly right. There's some very recent news about one of the daughters, and maybe she is indeed trying to help this case move forward. Of course, at the center of this whole case is the video, the video that we talked about at the start a little bit, perpetrator dressed up in police riot gear, walking in the church before Missy showed up. Um, Tim, is it a man or a woman? I lean toward man, but it's not a hard lean because it is tough to tell. Yeah. Yeah. I read information today that even the investigators are split on it. You've got some that think it's a man, others that think it's a woman. Uh, initially, when the information came out, they were phrasing it like they were talking about a male suspect. And then there was kind of a, a retraction done on that direction where they were being very clear. We don't know if it's a male or a female. Uh, of course, the way that the perpetrator walks has been analyzed a lot. Uh, people thinking, is that a feminine sway? Uh, is that a leg injury of some kind? A lot of different considerations going on with that. In terms of the way they're dressed up, is it, do you think it's real tactical gear or do you think that it's a costume that has been put together? To me, I, I think that they cobbled together pieces from different sources. And I know some of the law enforcement people who have been interviewed about the case seem to feel the same. And I, I trust their judgment. I think law enforcement is probably the best uh, arbiter of, of whether something is, is genuine or not. So for them to use phrases such as, I believe Carl Smith, the police chief, compared it to something you'd see on a TV show where, you know, on 911 or uh, a SWAT show or whatever, where they're trying to look like law enforcement, but they're obviously not in actual law enforcement gear. So to hear him say that makes me think that it probably is something that was ordered uh, and probably not from a legitimate law enforcement source. That's uh, my or, opinion. or possibly pieces that were put together. Um, I, I had so many brain scratchers that were reaching out and saying, uh, you know, you can go to a surplus store and you can find some of these parts at surplus stores. So, yeah, maybe it's a mix. Maybe it's a hybrid. Uh, we're not even sure. The uh, warrants, after looking through all the warrants that I have today, they definitely seem to lean towards it being, I mean, they specifically call it tactical slash riot gear. They really don't ever address it as being a costume or being, you know, fake in some way. Uh, so at least in terms of how the warrants are written, it, it seems like they're thinking it is some, in, in some form, it's the legitimate stuff. Maybe not in the right configuration or maybe it's parts and pieces. Uh, I also wanted to credit you guys for... Um, opening up my brain about the headlamp. I never considered that there was an actual headlamp there. And when I first heard that, I actually doubted it. I was like, I don't remember seeing a headlamp. Are they confusing some of the reflection? I went back through today and watched the videos again, all of them from top to bottom. I watched all my videos again, which was an interesting thing, just seeing what's <laughs> happened to me and my show over the past two years. Um, but there is clearly, especially in the longer clip, the two minute clip where they have all of the different clips put together, towards the end of that, you can very clearly see uh, where they are walking through a door and the light is emanating on the inside of the wall. Uh, so very clearly they have a headlamp. And then of course, in one of the warrants, um, their own phrasing in terms of how the warrant is written is tactical or police style gear to include, but not limited to ballistic vest or carrier. 
boots, jacket, pants, protective pads for elbows and knees, gloves, helmet with mounted lighting, specifically in their own search term. Uh, pry tools such as crowbars and hammers or weapons utilized or possessed by the suspect as depicted in the crime scene video surveillance footage from April 18th, 2016. And I did see a lot of conversation about is there potentially more in terms of the weapons? And I think what we have to keep in mind where they talk about the crime scene video surveillance footage, that's not necessarily what we saw. I believe we've seen pieces of that, but they have more video, I believe, that we haven't seen. Um, so they could be referring to their version of that video, and that might include some other type of weapon. At least that's kind of where I'm at it. What, what's your feeling on that? Well, when you go back to uh, an early search warrant in this case, one of the first flurry of search warrants that was re released in this case, there's reference to um, a firearm. Uh, there's... It, let, let me explain a little bit about how, the, how this works with, with the search warrants. Uh, some search warrants were not released um, publicly until the uh, law enforcement Midlothian Police Department could get a, an opinion from the Texas Attorney General as to what they are required to release. Uh, under the Texas Public Information Act, what some people uh, refer to as Freedom of Information Act, but that's the Texas Act um, versus what they can withhold because of it being part of investigation. And some of the information that came back from that, from, from their correspondence with the Attorney General and the opinion that the Attorney General came back with was that uh, there was a, what they said was a firearm serial number. Now, some people speculated that perhaps Missy had a weapon uh, or perhaps they were just using uh, law enforcement at the scene, uh, their guns as just a way to try to get around having to release information, which based upon my information, that's not how law enforcement works. They're not going to try to monkey around with uh, the rules about uh, with what they can release by m making up something. We're not talking about law enforcement's uh, weapon. We're, we're talking about something that was at the scene. Is, yeah, is, I was struck by I that. Believe. I was struck by that also. Um, and thank you for having that document posted where we can all go and look at it for ourselves. But essentially, the lawyer is using that as one of the reasons for them to not disclose any information publicly about this case. They're saying, hey, look, specifically, like we have a serial number for a gun. And if that was to get out, then things could happen with that information. What I'm curious about is if they have a serial number for that gun, um, did they try to track it to its registered owner? Is this does this mean that it it's a stolen weapon of some kind that they couldn't track it there. Uh, you raise a good point. Is it potentially a weapon that Missy had that she armed herself with? Was she concerned that someone might hurt her? Um, so there's certainly implications from understanding that there's a firearm. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later because there's actually a few other points that I think might support that theory that in some way we have a firearm involved with this case as well. Um, in terms of the person that we're talking about, the best description that we've got is five foot two to five foot seven, white complexion. Uh, I'm a little surprised that they haven't been able to pin down the height. Uh, I know a fellow YouTuber named Gray Hughes who does a lot of really good work in terms of analyzing footage and determining sizes and things like that using 3D tools. Gray was kind enough to actually send me a few different takes on his analysis here. Um, but this image I'm showing you is one where the assumption is that the door is seven feet tall. Uh, and apparently these types of doors can range between six foot eight to seven feet. So it's kind of tough because we don't have the exact measurement. If we are correct about this being uh, seven feet tall, this would put the suspect right in the range of probably five, seven to five, nine. You can see they're getting pretty close to that uh, six foot marker. And you have to keep in mind they're wearing the helmet, which is probably adding a bit of height to them as well. Uh, but certainly nowhere near the 5'2 mark, as we're kind of hearing from authorities. Uh, once again, thank you, Gray. And I will have a link to Gray's channel in the description box below.
And that's one of the perplexing things about this case, among many perplexing things, is why would Midlothian Police Department uh, tell Brandon initially in those first few days six feet tall? Because he said that in a media interview, six feet, which was what was relayed to him by uh, MPD. And then they changed it to 5'7 to 5'9. And then they later changed it to where it is now, according to them, which is 5'2 to 5'7. That's you know, it, that's a big range. That that's a range that doubled in size. <laughs> when you talk about five seven to five nine to five two to five seven, that's that's uh, that's a range that doubled. And I, I've talked to a couple of people with a background in uh, illustration software and editing software who seem to have pretty good credentials, um, and. They they think more along the lines of five ten to six feet. I can't vouch for them as as experts, but I, I'm pretty I'm pretty swayed by that. And and just looking at you know as a layman, just looking at uh, at uh, that video footage, it, it seems to me that five two to five seven is is much shorter than this person really is. Yeah. But I'm not an expert. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the tough aspects of this case, because you think if investigators really want the public's help here, <laughs> let us help you guys, but get us some decent details so we can go on that. And that's that's really a hard aspect. Um, now, a lot of people have thought about the theory that this person might have been there to rob the church. People talked about, you know, the church might have had collections from Sunday service that were stored up somewhere there, something along those lines. I've always struggled with it because uh, the person's not carrying any bag or any means of, you know, I'm going to be removing things from this place, <laughs> you know, so how right. could this really be a robbery? Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't think that it was probably their initial intention to rob. Uh, you, you do make a really great point there. The, the person is basically empty handed other than maybe they've got a utility, you know, pack a uh, pouch on them or, or maybe their vest holds a few things but mostly they've got tools in those pouches on their vest already right. so what are they going to do with something if they do decide to steal it um, but then again you know it could be that they're casing the church and seeing what's there and maybe they have something out in the car if they've got the car parked at the back door, they could easily go out and, and retrieve a bag and come back in uh, most people or a lot of people say, well, they didn't take anything, so that's evidence right there that it wasn't a robbery. Well, if it's a robbery interrupted, then that would explain why yeah. the person didn't take anything because they didn't have a chance to take anything. But I, I lean away from that um, simply because the person is so nonchalant um, as they as they walk around the church. It's like they're in no hurry. Someone who burglarizes with the intent of taking things uh, usually gets in and has a sense of purpose and they don't have a nonchalant attitude such as what this perpetrator seems to be displaying on the video. Yeah, I kind of agree with that as well. Just to play devil's advocate though, a couple of other points. Um, I don't know if you have seen this in the footage, but I did some analysis where I saw something that looked like a white box, like a rectangular white box being in the person's hand. Uh, yes. If they were planning on stealing things, could it be a box for trash bags, you know, black trash bags or something that they could then pull out and put the stuff into something along those lines? And Brandon actually raises probably the best point when he says uh, he doesn't think that this is a robbery. I think initially he might have commented he did, but I know recently he says, uh, the person didn't take her ring. What kind of robbery would this be? She was still wearing her, her wedding ring. So, yeah. You don't necessarily think about things like a wedding ring, uh, especially after you've attacked someone. And if he was surprised by her presence there, um, you know, you, you're not necessarily going to be thinking clearly to reach down and try to remove a ring from a finger. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and who knows after she fell, her, her hand could have been under her and and maybe it would have concealed a ring on on the finger so uh, a lot of factors there that could indicate you know that uh, that the person wasn't aware of the ring yeah absolutely really good points 
Um, and then of course, for me is whenever I see footage like that, I'm like, well, where's the other end of this footage? Where's the footage of the person actually leaving? Now, in one of the early uh, search warrants, the evidentiary search warrant, they give a pretty strong description of the footage that they have, I, I believe, in whole. So I'm going to read that real quick. At approximately 0418 hours, the victim, Terry Beavers, is observed entering the building through the main door under the awning area. The video shows Terry Beavers walking toward where the suspect's location Neither the suspect nor victim were seen again on video. The victim was later found deceased at the southwest corner of the interior of the building. Terry Beavers had multiple puncture wounds found on her head and chest, and they're consistent with the tools the suspect was carrying throughout the building. And I think this is part, this was reported, if I remember correctly, by NBC initially, and they're just picked up by everyone. They kept, you know, oh, we now know what happened. She must have been attacked with the hammer or and or the crowbar, uh, multiple puncture wounds, et cetera. But according to this, there's no footage of them leaving. So uh, I'd be very curious to know what was the escape route? Did they break a window at that point and go out the window? How did they not get back in the hall where we know that there was cameras in the hallway? Um, do you have any input or feedback on that? Uh, if the attack happened in the uh, the west foyer which is the main entrance into the church if it happened around that area and if the camera that is zeroed in on that entrance wasn't working then i could understand how they might have escaped without it being caught on camera if they had run to the north and then to the uh, east to get out through the kitchen area which is where they were believed to uh, to have entered, then it could be that the camera didn't kick in quickly enough. Right. So when it's motion so, activated. Right. So in other words, uh, there may be video, but the video may just have an empty hallway. Right. Where where it kicked in after the person had already exited the scene. I suspect that they were moving much more quickly uh, in the aftermath of the murder than than what we saw uh, pre murder, um, because they wouldn't have have stuck around. Um, for, for one, they may not have known whether there was someone else there. Um, uh, someone else could have pulled into the parking lot as far as they knew. Um, they may not have exited that way. They may have exited right through that West entrance. Um, you know, that's where the crime scene tape was, was in the, in the, the West entrance. And, um, you know, not a lot of information from police about how, how things looked after the murder, but that would be another reason why it wouldn't have been caught on tape because the perpetrator would have been right there at the exit. Yeah. Yeah. Another good point. Uh, now something else I noticed in here is this information seems to conflict a little bit with, um, there's a link that you have posted up, uh, at gumshoestories.com about the location of where it happened in the church. According to this information, it's saying the victim was found deceased at the southwest corner of the interior of the building. But then the link that you have with the highlighted information is we walked through the south breezeway doors into the main foyer to the north side of the church. I saw a white female laying on her back. Got any idea what that discrepancy is about between southwest corner and the north side? I, I that threw me for a loop when I first read it. Um, that is that is a law enforcement officials report uh, narrative of uh, of what he encountered, and I don't think that he necessarily hung on every word as he wrote it. So I think there's some some language issues there. But as I can best interpret it, he says that he goes in the the south. Uh, awning entrance to the church. So for him, that's the south point. And then I think what he intends to say is just that he is moving north from okay. that point. Law enforcement, as part of their training, Law Enforcement 101 with a crime scene is establishing uh, your perimeter of, of the crime scene and what north, south, west, and east are. Right. And, beca and because the the west entrance was blocked off, and because everyone was being directed to the awning, the south entrance, 
Um, and that was where the crime scene log was. That's where everybody had to log in before they entered the crime scene. That was south to them. And then everything moving from there uh, straight up that hallway as you enter became north. I think he just meant to say that he moved north from there, not that he moved all the way to the north side of the building. Got it. That, that's the best interpretation I can give of that. Yep. Um, okay. So once again, talking about the weapon, we mentioned that the evidentiary search warrant talked about the multiple puncture wounds. Uh, we talked about, it seems like there's a gun for some reason at play here. Um, the warrant for her truck simply states deceased from a head wound. So now we have something that's just a little bit different than the evidentiary warrant. Uh, and that an unknown instrument was used in killing her, which is once again, somewhat removed from the other analysis of, you know, we recognize their puncture wounds. They seem consistent with the tools that the suspect was carrying in this warrant for her truck, which admittedly was written earlier, I would imagine. I mean, they found her truck on site when they showed up. It's probably one of the first warrants that they kicked in. But at that point, they were saying she's deceased from a head wound. They didn't note that there was any wounds to the chest and it was an unknown instrument. I think that would suggest that the hammer or the uh, crowbar, if it was used, was probably not left behind because I think that they would have noted in this warrant that they, they knew what the instrument was that was used. Um, and then, of course, you mentioned the attorney general document that is suggesting that a firearm is part of this case that they have a serial number that they wish to keep private. They won't exactly tell us why, but they think it would certainly interfere with the case. Um, I found another piece of information about this at murderdata.org, which is a place that you can do statistical analysis using the FBI's data on murders for the past few decades. And I basically drilled it down to uh, Ellis County in Texas and found uh, that for 2016, um, there was only one murder that fit the conditions of being Missy's murder. It involved a 45 year old female. They didn't have the names of course, but involved a 45 year old female and the weapon was a handgun that was noted for actually being the, the type of murder for a handgun. So once again, just looking at all this paperwork, there's something very strong about the possibility of a gun being involved here. And at least if I'm correct about that information at murderdata.org, the FBI's data is categorizing her murder as a death by handgun. That's very interesting. It, you know, what? one thing to point out, um, even if they do have a serial number on a gun, if, if there is in fact a gun, um, the things we see on shows like CSI where someone goes and types in a serial number and, and bam, they, they can trace everything about it. That's really not how it works. If you look into uh, the FBI and the E-Trace, which is the way that law enforcement does a search um, of the FBI's database, or actually it's the ATF that, uh, that maintains this information, it's not all digital. In fact, a lot of it is not digital. It's not in a computer. A lot of it is physical records that right. may have been put on microfiche or microfilm um, simply because if a dealer closes his doors, a gun dealer, he by law has to send his information, his files to the ATF. But there is there's nothing that says that he has to put it in any kind of a nice format for them. And a lot of gun dealers – don't necessarily like the government very right. much. And so they could send it on napkins. They could send it in uh, whatever format they choose that's going to make it very difficult to search up. And so as a result, only, I believe, 70% of E-Trace searches are successful. There's a lot of guns out there. Just because you find a gun and just because it has a serial number on it that hasn't been filed off doesn't mean that it's going to be able to be traced back to the last person that had that gun. Right. And there's a whole secondary market too. I mean, it could be the gun that I bought that I wound up selling to someone at a show that they wound up giving to their nephew. I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of activity that can happen with that record not being updated properly. Um, now, one of the things that came out pretty early in the investigation was that Brandon and Missy did not have a perfect marriage. 
There seemed to be uh, some financial struggles and then some infidelity that was mentioned. And the warrants kind of point to that as well. Uh, according to the Brandon Beavers Facebook search warrant, investigators were specifically told by Brandon that Missy was having an affair with a gentleman named Kevin Cozine. And when I looked into this initially, uh, Kevin and his wife, Michelle, both had Twitter accounts. They were active Twitter accounts. One of the things that I noted was Kevin did not talk about Missy's murder around the time of her murder at all. Uh, Michelle did uh, certainly retweeted some of Missy's daughters uh, talking about it. Um, I don't know what has happened, but since those Twitter accounts are now gone, uh, so Kevin and Michelle no longer on, in social media. Maybe it's an effect of what we've been talking about with, uh, you know, just the critics and the armchair sleuths, you know, hammering on this. Maybe it was too much for them, but they have since pulled out. But I was very interested to see that specifically uh, the investigators were told by Brandon that Missy was having an affair with Kevin. Uh, uh, if I if I could interject, John. Yeah. Uh, Kev, Kevin and his wife actually divorced, so they are no longer together. And Kevin, you can find him on social media and you can find references to um, his his latest romantic involvement. And I believe her name is Michelle as well. Oh, um, interesting. But it's a different Michelle. But yeah, I, I can confirm based on information that I've seen um, is that they have divorced. And he has a single Facebook account now and it references, you know, someone else as his as lady love now. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I, that's one of those things that just, if we're looking, um, it's interesting because you could look at it from a few different sides, either that Brandon might've been upset about her having these extramarital affairs and maybe that's motive for Brandon or that, uh, Kevin wanted to end it for some reason or that Michelle found out about it. I mean, just in terms of motive, uh, these types of interpersonal affairs certainly spread enough for everyone to go around and really, I'm sure, make this a bit of a tougher investigation. Well, and let me add this, you know, people seem to think that there was definitely an affair there. And, and I would caution against believing that 100 percent simply because from the search warrants, from the information that we've seen, law enforcement said that Brandon told them that right. Missy was having an affair with Kevin Cozine. Now, is is Brandon's information true? Maybe, but you know we don't have law enforcement saying that there was an affair. We only have law enforcement saying that the spouse told them that yep. the deceased was having an affair. So that's that's an important consideration. Definitely. Um, that there's also um, we see from from other search warrants that there was a gentleman named Casey Williams mm -hmm. who she was involved with um, in terms of a flirty. Uh, online uh, communication through LinkedIn. Um, did that ever become something more? We, we don't know. Uh, it, it could have just been online communications. We see from search warrants that uh, the police investigators looked at that information and they certainly referred to it as flirty and familiar. But what's their definition of flirty and familiar? How explicit did it get? We don't know because we don't have access to that information. But certainly there seems to be a lot of smoke in terms of involvement there between Missy and um, at least two individuals, Kevin and Casey. But um, we don't have any hard evidence that anything actually happened. Yeah. Did you bump into any information about Brandon potentially having any affairs? Nothing other than rumor. The okay. locals... Um, and, and certainly people in Facebook groups devoted to the case um, discussed a lot of that type thing, but there was never anything that was really mentioned. Uh, that doesn't mean it didn't happen, but right. we, we, don't, we don't have anything from law enforcement and nothing mentioned in any search warrants. You know, they, they said in the search warrants external relationship and then in ellipses, in parentheses, they have an S, meaning that maybe there was more than one, maybe there wasn't. So it was a conditional plural, yeah. okay? Um, and that could have referred to Brandon and Missy or could have referred to just Missy. So right. who knows? Yeah, I couldn't find anything real strong on that either, at least in the uh, official media. And 
I don't know if you would because the focus of this investigation is certainly on who would want to harm Missy kind of in a very specific direction. So I, I don't know that that would necessarily come out. So with all this in mind, um, are any of the Beavers family still in consideration for you as being persons of interest or potentially involved in this? I, I don't think any of the main individuals in the family that we've seen um, are really on the table for me. Um, I, it's possible that Brandon could have hired somebody. You know, you, you always have to look at the spouse until until the killer's caught. And I think think even uh, Kevin Johnson at the Lothian Police Department has said that is that you can't really completely rule out someone until the killer is caught. But they certainly have been very protective of the family, um, and he's always been careful to say Kevin Johnson has that uh, that the family is not a focus of the investigation. Yeah. So I'm, I, I just I would need to see more where Brandon is concerned um, to to make me look more toward him. I just just don't see any evidence to point to that. Yeah, and then we get this other piece also via LinkedIn of some type of creepy message that is sent to her three days prior to the attack from a male that she didn't know. She showed a close friend of hers this message. Uh, right. I guess the friend could not recall the name. Do you have any other details on that aspect? Three days or well, within three days is what the, the documentation actually said uh, of the murder. Well, if the murder happened Monday and you count back within three days of that, she was in Austin for a Camp Gladiator conference. So she was with other people. Um, here's a theory. My theory is that we already know she was having some sort of a relationship with Casey Williams on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. This creepy message was on that same platform. What if she left her phone unlocked and we know that police didn't have any trouble getting into it after the murder, so she didn't have any any lock code on her on her phone and it is what an iphone she, and it's an iphone right yeah what if she went to the restroom left her uh, phone on the table uh and her friend just happened to see a message that arrived and it appeared creepy to the friend and maybe missy was embarrassed and simply said um i have no idea what that is or who that's from mm -hmm. no idea that's just that's just speculation but to me, it's it's kind of an educated guess, maybe, because we are talking about the same platform. And, uh, you know, if, if I had something going on uh, that was inappropriate um, and a little over the line and I was with someone who knows that I'm married and is a, a friend of mine and they see it, you know, I, I might play dumb. And, yeah. and I like I don't know what that is. And it's creepy. So who knows? Yeah. No, that's really good insight. And I really appreciate – this is one of the reasons I think why I enjoyed your podcast so much is uh, – and why I hope people appreciate the way that I work is I try to make a very clear distinction between here's information and here's where it's coming from and here's what I think about it. <laughs> and here's something that I've theorized based on that. Uh, I think it's really important to do that. And once again, that is a, that is more of the responsible way of discussing this case in this so social media space that I think a lot more of us should be doing. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for doing that. Yeah. This, this case, you know, there's categories of information here that there's what we think we know and there's what we don't know. And then there's what we know we know. Right. Well, that last category is very small yeah. of what we know that we know. Yeah. Um, and so it is important to make that distinction that uh, police have been very tight-lipped about this case. They became more tight-lipped after those initial uh, few weeks of the case. And so we don't have a lot to go on other than our own speculation. Yeah, and I really like the separation between the information uh, between Kevin Cozine and then Casey Williams that you've pointed out because the police reviewed the messages for themselves in terms of Casey Williams. And they classified that as being at least a flirtatious relationship where – like when you were talking about Kevin, that's information that's coming from Brandon. It's, I mean, it's hearsay at that point. It's really about perspective of someone other than law enforcement. So we and, have, and you know, other than uh, 
the Facebook warrants and the LinkedIn warrants that were executed and, and maybe looking at phone records for Kevin Cozine and, and what these individuals might have turned over um, on their own without a search warrant. We, we don't know of any search warrants that were executed against those individuals. Right. Um, so that would lead us to believe after all this time that there may not have been a whole lot there implicating those two. Yep. So we're talking about a town of roughly 20,000 people, Midlothian. Um, she actually lived in Red Oak, right? Which I think is about a population of 10,000. Uh, and we still have a case that hasn't been cracked. Do you think that this person is a local resident that lives in that area that is somehow slipping under the radar? Or do you think they might have come in from somewhere else? That church sits on a highway. And there are a lot of towns that basically are adjacent to one another. When you're looking at Red Oak and Ovilla and Midlothian, um, there's um, DeSoto. There, there's quite a few towns in that area. So the idea of, well, it's a small town, it's not really, because we're still talking about the Dallas Metroplex. Right. Um, and, and there are some rural areas out there, but they're just right on the cusp of urban areas. It's very mobile. Um, and it, it wouldn't be unforeseeable that, you know, someone could have committed this murder from, from outside the area. And if so, if they don't have ties to the area, then that makes the case just that much more difficult to crack. Yeah. And definitely because you're also dealing with different jurisdictions at that point and what the police can do in their area, they might not be able to do as effectively in other areas requires coordination and other stuff along those lines, which I would imagine is probably pretty easy with a case like this to get coordination from other departments. But sometimes it's just a matter of not knowing where to look. So um, I've seen several comments made by law enforcement that they are holding on to some critical piece of evidence that they are keeping secret that they basically want to drop on the person when, when they find their suspect. Got any thoughts on what, what could they be holding on to that would be? I, I actually do. And, and I believe that Kevin Johnson said it most specifically um, because the question was about um, what was found at the scene. And um, I believe he was referring to tools. He, he used the term tools uh, sent for analysis and that sort of thing. But we know from, from public records, some of the things that we've referenced here um, in this podcast today, that uh, we're not talking so much about a tool as we're talking about a weapon. And uh, I believe, and this is why I'm careful not to say too much or point people to specifically to the open records that I've looked at and that you've seen. Uh, they may be open records, but police have been very um, silent about discussing that in media. So if they're not going to discuss a document, there's a reason why they're not discussing it. And there are certain things that they really do need to keep under wraps. Um, and so I believe that the reference that you're talking about is to the weapon or a weapon that was found at the scene, was it necessarily the murder weapon? We don't know. Just because it was found at the scene doesn't mean that it was used in the murder. Right. But I, but I do believe it is a reference to that weapon. And we've talked about serial numbers and things. So, uh, you know, people can read between the lines as to what that weapon was. But we do not know if it was, um, if it was used. Right. Uh, and then DNA – has also, of course, been thought about. Uh, one of the things I was concerned about when I saw the footage was, uh, would there be much DNA left behind, even if there was an interaction directly between Missy and the perpetrator because they were so well covered? Um, we have a little uh, bit of current news on the DNA we're going to get to. But before we jump to that, the car at SWFA that shows up in the security camera footage. Mm -hmm. Do you think that car is related to this crime? Do you think that's just something else that happened to happen that night? It's very coincidental that something that out of the ordinary would would occur basically catty corner to the church. And then two hours later, something so out of the ordinary happens at the church involving a murder. So coincidental things do happen <laughs> all the time. And then we have a hard time believing that they're coincidental until we find out that they were totally unrelated. But, um, 
I, I lean toward it being involved somehow, uh, but I just don't know. And uh, maybe you were going to get to this um, during the podcast, John, but um, there's a, a dark SUV that's mentioned in the December 2016 search warrant uh, on an individual uh, that uh, that was part of the probable cause that was put forth in an affidavit in order to get that search warrant was that a witness saw a dark SUV, small SUV, uh, pulling out at 4.30 a.m. out of the church parking lot, not SWFA, the church parking lot. Well, that could only be the killer, you would think, because the first camper got to the church at 4.35. Missy's already dead. The person leaving at 4.30 has to be the killer. So we actually have two vehicles but only one that police have even acknowledged and spoken about to the public and the media. They have not mentioned that dark SUV, but there it is in a search warrant for anyone who happens to have read that search warrant. So I find that very interesting as well. Yeah, that was probably the thing that grabbed me the most when I reviewed the materials on your website was that particular search warrant. And I do want to clue everyone in on what that is. So I'm going to go through it real briefly. Help me fill in the holes if I happen to miss anything. But this is a search warrant that was released in September of 2017. It looks like that's when it officially became released to someone, but we don't know who because their name has been redacted from <laughs> who it was released to. Um, there's a person of interest named Bobby Wayne Henry. And let me just say, Tim and I actually talked about, should we talk about this guy's name or not on Tim's podcast? He didn't. Um, here, I think that we are safe to because Bobby Wayne Henry has been interviewed from the media specifically about him being incarcerated. Uh, and the way they presented that was that he was in jail for having something to do with this or being in consideration for being related to this crime. And if you look into the details, mm, not quite what happened, but um, so Bobby Wayne Henry, former law enforcement officer, specifically worked as a tactical officer. Guy was seen at Missy's service, volunteered to work as a security guard for it, has a dark SUV similar to the one seen leaving the church that morning. Uh, he confirms himself that he owns a helmet similar to the one seen in the video. He says he does have a tactical vest, but that it doesn't fit anymore. What I'm curious about there is, could he potentially have had more than one? You know, just because you've got one that might have been in your uh, your rookie year or something doesn't mean that that would have been the only one that you had through all your service. Sure. Um, he does admit he walks with a strange gait similar to what is seen in the video. Uh, and he worked at and attended the same church as Missy and her family, his story is that he got up at 3 a.m. that night to feed his uh, newborn infant and his wife got w got ready to, for work. I'm a little confused on what the timing is there, if she would have gotten up at 3 a.m. to get ready for work. Um, can you help us fill in the holes there? Anything I'm missing on that? No, that's, uh, that, that's, that's pretty good. Um, the search warrant does say he worked and attended the same church as the Beavers, um, which, you know, if it's in a search warrant, which is sworn to before a judge in order to get a judge to sign, you think police are going to be careful to fact check that. However, Missy and her family went to Cowboy Church of Ellis County, right. and there's no evidence that Bobby Wayne Henry ever worked at Cowboy Church uh, or attended there. And I have looked into that and just cannot find anything. And in fact, all the evidence seems to point toward um, that not being the case, um, that he actually attends the Avenue Church and is part of the security team there. In fact, he served along with other members of the security team from Ave Avenue Church uh, on the, uh, the funeral or memorial service, I should say, for, uh, for Missy um, after her death. Um, at, at the request of the church, the church called and asked them to serve as security. So that's why he was there. You know, there was there was video footage from that um, memorial service of Bobby Wayne Henry patrolling a parking lot, basically walking around. And uh, this footage shows his walk and it appeared similar to the gait of the suspect and the, the video 
uh, perspective was actually pointed down at his feet, uh, which led me to believe that perhaps law enforcement had told some of the media that were there to help them out by focusing on the gate of individuals that uh, were in attendance there. And so it, it, it becomes perhaps a little bit prejudicial uh, to anybody watching that footage that they see a camera zooming in on the feet, right. you know, and, and that's not typical footage. You're usually showing people's faces and it's showing his feet, which I think led to police's, uh, the, the police department looking at him because a lot of tips came in, multiple tips came in about him after that video footage came out. Right. Yeah. Now we have him interviewed and I have a link to that down below. Uh, and thank you, Tim, for sending that to me as well. And in the interview, he says he didn't know, Missy, he didn't know the Beavers at all. Uh, so once again, kind of supporting the information Tim's given us, uh, maybe not the same church. Maybe there wasn't such a strong connection there. But in terms of the gate analysis, they actually hired a professional to do a gate analysis on that, Dr. Michael Narenberg, and he could not rule out Bobby Wayne Henry as, uh, as being potentially the culprit. Um, he thinks that it's certainly possible he was the same person. Now, also in that news segment, you will see that uh, Bobby Wayne Henry passed a polygraph and his alibi has been confirmed. I don't know how you would necessarily confirm an alibi of I was at home at three o'clock in the morning. I, I guess you talk to his wife, uh, but she would certainly have something to lose if he went to jail. You know, um, he's, he's a, at least a recent father. I don't know if he has more children on top of that. Um, but according to WFAA, police have cleared and released him. Now, what's kind of interesting is that segment really does not go into what the charge was. How did they put him in prison for 70 days? Well, when they executed the search warrant, actually let me back up a little bit. The timing is a little bit curious because they first interviewed him in May, early May, after those tips came in, after that video footage showing his gate. He was interviewed May the 6th, I want to say. It was, it was the first week of May. And yet that search warrant was not executed until December of that year. Okay. So seven months went by uh, before it was executed. Now, did they possibly try to get uh, the search warrant earlier and didn't establish probable cause? Maybe they needed to get the forensic uh, doctor to, uh, to release his findings. Maybe that took a while. Maybe the witness with the dark SUV did not come forward immediately. Maybe they came forward later in the process. We don't know how many, how many times search warrants were uh, attempted and denied by the judge. We only know that at the seven-month mark, he finally signed off on it. And that's, that's when uh, the, the search warrant was executed. Now, they seized 12 electronic devices in December from his home. And those devices were sent to the FBI for analysis. And over the next several months, uh, the FBI found what they categorized as child pornography on one of the devices. And they reported that back to the Midlothian Police Department. And at that point, a, uh, an arrest warrant was prepared and he was arrested in June. Not on the Missy Beavers case. It was unrelated to Missy Beavers. It was on the child pornography. He was arrested and there was a $200,000 bond set, which he could have attempted to post, but for whatever reason, maybe he couldn't come up with the money. Uh, he chose not to. He sat there in jail for 70 plus days when he could have bonded out. So um, the, the charge was child pornography, possession of child pornography. And he was finally released because a grand jury looked at the case and chose not to indict him because of issues with the evidentiary chain and him not having sole possession of the device on which that child pornography was found. So the grand jury determined that um, you could not really prove that he would have been the one who downloaded uh, those images since other people had access to the device. Right. And let me just say, uh, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have Tim on for this specific episode. Um, I went looking for information on this and it is so hard to find details of what's going on here. You can find a couple of pictures of him like at mugshots.com with some very light details. I, I couldn't even find the guy's height 
I was wondering if he was in the range, you know, the five two to five seven that we've been hearing about for the six, last one. Six, six one. Six one is is what his public information uh, lists for him. And the the arrest report from the Logan Police Department lists him as six one. Wow. Wow. Oh, uh, so yeah, a little bit of a heartbreaker because as I was reading that warrant and maybe they had to write it that way to get it to go through, but you're reading it going, this has to be the guy. Like all the pieces are there. The guy literally has a helmet. He literally has the background. He's got the gate. I mean, so many of the pieces seem to fit, but then ultimately we come out of this and it seems like he isn't. Um, more updates of what's happened over the past year. In November of 2017, they had the second annual Downtown Dash 5K uh, held in Missy's honor. And then in January of 2018, we're coming current now, the leading, uh, the lead investigator is changed. Now we get a new lead investigator, Sergeant Andy Vaughn, took over from the original investigator, Corporal Cody Moon, who transferred back to the patrol division. Seems like kind of a hard bump there to go from investigations to back to patrol. I don't know how often it happens or if that means something else is at play here, but I was kind of curious about that. You got any thoughts on that? Uh, Cody Moon was very heavily involved in the Bobby Wayne Henry aspect of the case. Um, I, I wonder, I just wonder this, if uh, the police department decided that uh, if more information came out about Bobby Wayne Henry and the name Cody Moon was on those search warrants, that uh, it might might reflect poorly on the police department's investigation and the avenues that they had chosen to go down that didn't uh, that didn't pan out. And so, rather than subject themselves to more scrutiny, maybe they thought, well, we'll we'll move him back and we will get him back out of the limelight and get a new person in. And that way, it it kind of portrays to the public that there are a set of fresh eyes looking at the case from an investigative lead standpoint, um, which is a pretty shrewd move, pretty smart. However, he's not really fresh eyes. Uh, Andy Vaughn has been involved with the case from the beginning. So he's been a member of the team. He just has not been the lead on the team. So I, I don't know what new perspective he might bring. Um, not certainly not as much of a fresh eyes as if you brought s someone who was a seasoned detective from another jurisdiction that you could bring in and assign full time someone who has closed murder cases. And that's, you know, Mid Midlothian opens themselves up to um, to questioning when when we see them put people on this case who have never closed a murder case in their life. And how do we know that? Because Midlothian doesn't have murders. Right. Uh, this is the first murder in uh, almost a decade yeah. that occurred in Midlothian. In fact, Carl Smith couldn't even remember when the most recent one was when they asked him that first day. So you do have to wonder why uh, they haven't brought in more outside help. Now, they've consulted. They've gone and had little conferences with outside agencies. I believe it was in April of last year. Yep. They said that they went to Austin, they got together with three or four agencies and kind of laid out the case for them and, and you know, gave them um, the, the whole uh, look at the case and what they had so far to see what the perspective might be from these outside agencies. And we don't know what the outside agencies said. Right. So, uh, so perhaps there's there's more there that we don't know. You would think the FBI has probably given them a detailed profile of who the FBI thinks that this killer might be from a profile perspective, not from an identity perspective, but um, we don't have that information either. So there, there's certainly more out there that we don't know that Midlothian does that uh, that might get them a little bit closer to the killer than, than we think they are. Yep. But, uh, but I would just feel a lot better if, if there was a detective uh, on the case who had the title of detective, you know, Cody Moon, as you said, was was a patrol officer. He was in the patrol division. He wasn't someone who had ever uh, even been on a murder case, as far as I know, much less closed one. So that's that's a little concerning yeah. when you're when you're doing the backseat driving that that we're doing on this. 
Now, there was another aspect to this article um, reading about this changeover, and it was about the potential of them creating some type of digital composite based off of DNA and that they had submitted DNA for that to happen. But unfortunately, they learned that the DNA they submitted was partial. It wasn't complete enough for them to, to do the digital composite. Uh, and it's also mixed. They said specifically it was partial and mixed. So at least we know they've got some form of DNA on this case somehow. But, but not very much. And is it the DNA of the killer? Even right. if it weren't mixed, this happened in a church where there had been a, there was a church service the night before. Yeah, um, you've got hundreds of people, and and with the murder happening right there in the foyer area, that's where people enter and exit. So, not knowing more about how they obtained that DNA, did they obtain it off of her body? Right. Did they obtain it off the floor? We don't know, but. Uh, it's difficult to, to say with any certainty based on what we know that, well, that DNA has got to be from the killer and not just some church member. Yeah, very, very good point. Um, and this is another reason why I appreciate having you here, Tim. There's just so much to consider with all this, and I really thank you for uh, sharing this time with us. March 31st, 2018, one of the most recent news stories. High school freshman Allison Beaver's pig, Pepper, places fourth at the Ellis County Youth Expo and is sold for $15,000 to a, a group called the Ellis County Women in Business. Allison says she plans on donating the money to the investigation of her mother's murder. Uh, Brandon throws around some comments here saying he didn't know that she was planning on doing that. And uh, she says that she plans on doing more to raise money for her mom's investigation. They approach Midlothian PD with this. Apparently, Midlothian PD considers it for a few days. I saw some notes that maybe Brandon co co contacted them about this. Uh, they decide not to take it. MPD says that the investigation is funded. They don't need the additional money. So now Allison is considering donating a portion to uh, students with special needs in her mother's honor and keeping some for her own college tuition. And she currently plans on becoming a veterinarian in college. So, um, but a little bit of a different story than we heard from Brandon. Once again, <laughs> the guy that needs a PR person at the start of this episode who said that uh, it seemed like his family was not interested in, you know, focusing on finding the killer. You've got one of the daughters specifically making an amazing amount of money um, and wanting to donate that to her mother's investigation. So, Tim, what can we... Uh, well, I don't know if you know the format yet. What can we expect for episode two and when? Uh, very soon we will be taking a look in a little more detail at Bobby Wayne Henry um, and what led police to, uh, to focus on him so much and uh, maybe some other information that is, is pretty interesting where he's concerned that makes him a, a compelling figure in this, uh, even though – Police may say that that they're not looking at him anymore. You know that they, they have said that um, that their media response and their investigative strategy are two different things. Kevin said that uh, Kevin Johnson said that to uh, a local newspaper, which I found pretty compelling. He's basically saying we're, we can say whatever we want to to you guys in the media or you people in the public, but what we're doing behind the scenes isn't necessarily matched up with that. And so Kevin Johnson has told me very explicitly that he would be very surprised if Bobby Wayne Henry uh, ever comes up again in the investigation. That's pretty compelling until you hear him say that, you know, there's these two, two uh, opposite ends of the spectrum that can happen. So I don't know. It's, uh, we, we do have one coming out very soon, a podcast on gumshoe stories where we will kind of look at, uh, at him in a little more detail. Whether or not he's the killer, he's a very interesting character. Uh, I will say that about him. So um, as quickly as we can get that together uh, here in the coming weeks, uh, we'll put it out there. So we would love for people to um, to look at gumshoestories.com. We're also on YouTube and Facebook. Um, so you can find us uh, on any one of those platforms. 
Excellent. Tim, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming and sharing all this wonderful info with us. Like I said before, thank you for um, being such a good investigator and being so respectful to this information and how you're treating it. Uh, sharing your sources is such a major part, and I really appreciate that you're doing that as well. So thanks for your time today. Thank you, John. Appreciate all the updates on Missy that you've done from the beginning and for keeping the focus on, on the investigation so that she's not forgotten. Thank you so much. I, I really am focused on that quite a bit, and I'm happy that we're working on this together now to, to keep this exposure raised. That is it for this episode of Brain Scratch, everyone. Um, and as Tim said, I, I couldn't say it better myself. I am just so moved by this case. I'm a bit upset that we haven't seen better progress on it yet. I think I speak for a lot of you out there in terms of that. Uh, but I am hopeful that someday we will see justice arrive in this case, specifically for Missy's daughters. I believe that they really deserve an answer uh, as they get older and move through this life without their mom wondering what it would have been like for her to be there. There's got to be some reasoning that they can hold on to um, for trying to understand what what happened in this terrible, terrible case. And if there are any more developments, I'll be sure to let you know about it. I know I'll be keeping my eyes open. Let's talk about it in the comments below. What do you guys think? Uh, any new information that we talked about today? Let me know your thoughts. Please keep in mind, there's a very good chance at some point that uh, some of Missy's family will come across this video, will review your comments. So I ask that we all please be respectful and try to uphold that awesome brain scratch commentary I usually see from you guys. It's it's uh, It usually moves me to see when we're, we're being respectful of others' differing opinions. And you guys usually do a great job about that, but I just got to put out the warning, <laughs> especially for anyone new. Uh, thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful weekend and please come back on Monday to the Lord and Arts channel. I know I'll be here. Take care. <laughs>